Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Although it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit confusing when I say good afternoon because I'm in North America and it's morning my time. Type in the chat where you guys are from, where are you calling from or dialing in from. Uh, that way I could properly say uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you're coming from. I see 25 people in um, 25 people in the room. Or 23, 25. And welcome, Poland. Good afternoon. Okay. Good to know. It's good afternoon in your time. Poland, lots of people from Poland. Of course, this is a Polish uh, event. I, uh, this is, I think this is the third time I've been in, um, in, uh, with this event. Last year, I missed it um, due to some schedule conflicts, but I was with a uh, uh, data platform. Or not, <laughs> I'm thinking of a different conference that I'm doing later this uh, this afternoon with in my time. 2017 was the first time I was in uh, Wrocław. 2018 uh, was the second time. And then this year, I was actually looking forward to being in Poland again. Um, there were so many events happening on your side of the world, but unfortunately, this whole COVID thing happened. And so... This is still an opportunity for us to really get connected. Uh, everybody's saying good afternoon. How is your experience so far with uh, this whole virtual thing? And I know it's a little bit challenging because I'm so used to like looking at people and saying hi and like looking at them face to face. And this is a little bit weird. You can see me. I can't see you, but I'm pretending that I can actually look at you like straight through the camera right here. Um, again, welcome and thanks for joining in. Uh, this session is all about getting started with Linux for the SQL Server DBA. And quite interesting is, I'd say it's a little bit nostalgic because uh, I remember the time when I was a, I was a systems engineer for one of the Microsoft partners. And this was in the early 2000s. Uh, I was you know, part of our requirements to achieve the uh, Microsoft partner uh, status is for everyone on the team to uh, take certifications. I don't like taking tests, but I had to. Um, and I was joking around the fact that, you know, back then the MCSE, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, um, had some electives. And I was joking around the fact that, you know, we'll never know. Maybe one of these days, Linux might be an elective in the MCSE track. And my colleagues were laughing at me because when you think about it, 2000, this was the, the, the year or 2003, these were the years when, when Steve Ballmer was still the, uh, the CEO of Microsoft. And everywhere he went, whether it's the uh, Professional Developers Conference or any of the uh, Microsoft conferences worldwide, he would always say Linux is a cancer. And this is, um, um, again, a little bit nostalgic because just a couple of years ago before uh, Microsoft decided to kill the uh, Linux certification option for Azure, uh, that memory keeps coming back to me. And I was thinking, yeah, we're, we're looking at this it, it's no longer a, uh, it's no longer a joke. It's no longer something that we just wished happened. Although, it's still very difficult for, uh, for most of us to accept the fact that it is real. It is true that we are dealing with Linux. Uh, so this session is all about getting you started. I want to uh, let's get, let's get a bit of a an interaction here. Type it in the chat. What are you expecting out of the session? Why are you here? What are your goals? So answer those two questions. Why are you in this session? Because there are other sessions happening alongside with, with my session. Why are you here? And number two, what are your goals? Because it's important for you to not just know something about running SQL Server on Linux, but it's also important for you to know how I can achieve my goals and why I'm doing this. Because again, people are saying uh, information is, is um, information is power, is what a lot of people say, knowledge is power. I don't agree with that because a lot of people, you know, we all have our phones with us. We have the power of the internet, yet not a lot of people are learning because learning is different from just soaking up information. So type it in the chat window. Type it, uh, type it there. 
uh, oops, what are your goals for uh, uh, for attending the session? My name is Edwin Sarmiento. I'm a Microsoft Certified Master for SQL Server. And uh, my key area of expertise is on high availability and disaster recovery. And uh, very recently, I started doing a lot of uh, uh, running SQL Server on Linux or running SQL Server on Docker containers. Um, you might be wondering, what is a high availability guy doing in, you know, in the Linux world? I used to be a... Uh, I used to be an Oracle DBA before I became a SQL Server DBA. And we worked with mostly Unix and Linux environments. And for me, it, this is not new for me. This is like 15, tw almost 20 year old technology as far as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I just moved away from it to focus mostly on SQL Server, but it's Again, it's a little bit nostalgic going back to the things that I've done in the past. Now, I want to set the stage here. If I was a sales guy or if I was somebody who is working for Microsoft, I might tell you so many things about what SQL Server on Linux is all about. I could tell you all about, you know, being multi-platform. Now that you can run SQL Server on Windows, um, you can run SQL Server on Linux, you can run it on a, uh, the Docker container. It truly is a multi-platform. Now, I could also tell you about, you know, increased performance, how, you know, running SQL Server on Linux could, you know, when you really do measure the performance metrics, even though Microsoft is not going to admit that it is actually better performing on Linux than Windows, it is. But I'll let you do your own testing and figure it out on your own. I could also talk about reduced total cost of ownership when you look at, you know, uh, running a, a you know uh, a Linux environment where because nobody wants to touch it, you barely maintain it, right? Versus Windows where you're always logging in, you're typing and all of that, and you're clicking and dragging, you're, you're increasing your total cost of ownership just because of the fact that people are in there and doing something. I could also talk about, you know, how highly available it is. I mean, like I said earlier, uh, if you want your people or your admins or developers to, you know, not even touch something, deploy SQL Server on Linux. No UI, no nothing. They have to work with the command line in order for, for them to interact with the operating system. Trust me, they're not going to cause any outages because most of the outages are user inflicted. You know, somebody accidentally shut down the machine because they realized, oh, it's a, it's a production machine. It's not a development machine. But again, I'm not a sales guy. I don't, I'm not a marketing guy. I'm not a sales guy. And I'm, I don't focus on that. I don't focus on these features because these features are, you know, are useless if it's not, uh, if they're not going to help business. The reason that I focused on SQL Server on Linux is a little bit more personal. Yes, it is a little bit more personal. And forgive me for being emotional here, but again, it is really personal. Because when I was a DBA and I was in, uh, in operations, I used to work for a, uh, a managed service provider. And we're a remote ser uh, DBA service, services company. And when they hired me, they wanted to build the Microsoft practice, which means our key competency is not Microsoft. And the company is very well known all across the globe because they're a premier partner for one of these database vendors. You know that other database platform? Yeah, we were an Oracle partner. And the company was founded by a former Oracle DBA. The CTO was an Oracle ACE director. Uh, we have a ton of Oracle ACEs in the, in the, in the company. And so... Imagine being an outcast. What do I mean by that? Imagine being the only, well, not the only, but one in a handful of Microsoft people surrounded by a bunch of Unix, Linux, and open source uh, fanatics. I try to be politically correct. But imagine being in a room full of these people. You know, they're working with with all of the <clears throat> all of the open source platforms or working with stuff like you know OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, Red Hat, anything Linux. And the reason I share the story is because again, it's 
it's one of the reasons why I decided I will only work from home from then on. Why is that? Because here's how my day would look like. I come into the office, put my laptop on my desk, start working, and out of nowhere, you know how we were divided into multiple sections, the, the, the Microsoft engineers are in this corner, the Unix engineers are over there, the Oracle DBAs are over there, the uh, sysadmin people are over here. And this is how my day would look like. Somebody would shout, hey, those guys can't even use a real operating system. I mean, really? Come on. We're running mission critical databases on a Windows platform. And out of nowhere, you would hear a comment saying, use a real operating system. Here's what's even uh, what's even funny when you hear it. Let me see you manage SQL Server without the GUI. Oh, if they only knew that I have been managing SQL Server using PowerShell and SQL CMD even before <clears throat> SQL Server 2005. But of course, this is a group of people who only understand how to make fun of people like me. Here's another one. This is something that I, you know, sometimes it'll throw you off. I bet you're doing right-clicking exercises daily. You know, you right-click, you left-click, you right-click. Imagine the state of mind I am in as I'm trying to fix a performance, uh, a query performance issue or um, a, an outage because uh, an availability database is offline. And you hear comments at the back, in the background, people talking about you with these comments. In fact, this is, the, like I said, this is the, <clears throat> the reason I decided I don't want to come to the office. I'll just work from home. I will only go to the office if I need to, like I need to do paperwork. Because man, that's how I felt. I felt like the outcast. I felt like I was the odd man out. And they didn't even realize I used to be an Oracle guy. I do this stuff before. I, I, you know, I work with Unix. I work with Linux. But they, they don't care. What they do care about is that they are making fun of people. I call this the bullies in IT. Now, you know why I said this is a little bit personal to me? Because I hate bullies. And for the record, though, I don't hate Oracle. Like I said, I used to be an Oracle DBA. I work with the 6s, the 7s, the 8s, up to the 10G uh, platform. And I like it. In fact, for the record, I still claim that Oracle is a way better relational database engine than SQL Server. I just don't like the way they do stuff. And that's why I shifted to SQL Server. And again, whether it's Oracle running on Linux or Unix, this is what I did back then, right? But how I wish when they were, you know, throwing a, a bunch of these things, how I wish that they would just stop what they're doing, or maybe that Microsoft would decide, hey, we can run SQL Server on Linux. In fact, back in the days, it was just wishful thinking, like that comment that I made back in 2000, 2003 about having Linux certification as an elective for an MCN, MCSE certification. But here's the thing though, you know, when, when you see people, and I know this is a post on SQL Server Central from Steve Jones. It didn't help though that he uh, he wrote the article on 1st of April. And of course, everybody thinks that it's a joke. It is a joke, right? Not until 2017, because 2017, this became official. It was legit. And when you see a website from Microsoft telling you, hey, run SQL Server on your favorite platform, whether it's Linux, Windows, and Docker containers, you know Microsoft is serious about this. Um, and like I said, this is, for me, this is more than just, you know, a new technology that I want to, I want to explore. This is me making a statement. This is me trying to prove those people wrong. Did I say I, I hate bullies. I don't like people who make fun of other people. And this for me, diving into SQL Server on Linux is an opportunity to talk and not talk, but just prove people wrong, especially the Unix and the Linux guys, right? We're no longer um, the people who only manage SQL Server with, you know, the mouse. We can type, we can do more. We can be 
uh, you know, superheroes in our own way, uh, working with SQL Server on both Windows and Linux. And like I said, this is an opportunity to prove those people wrong. And I want to spend the rest of uh, the rest of this uh, remaining time in the session walking you through some of the things that you can do with working with SQL Server on Linux. Um, and again, um, put it in the chat, type it in the chat. What are your goals? What do you want? What are you here for? Are you like me who just wants to prove people wrong because, you know, the Unix guys and the Linux guys are bullying me, thinking I don't know how to use Windows or Linux? Um, what is your goal? Because I want you to really take away uh, the one thing that most DBAs are, you know, struggling with. The fact that it's a new operating system, the fact that they know nothing about Linux, the fact that in in, in their entire career, they only work with Windows. And this is something a little bit scary. And I can understand that. But like I said, this is an opportunity for us to prove those people wrong. So I'm going to share my, uh, I want to log into my demo environment just to show you uh, what I have. First off, okay, good. First off, you know, this is a very familiar environment. You'll be surprised. I'll be working with an environment that feels familiar to you because they're the same. It's the same environment that you've been working with for the past couple of years, ever since you started working with SQL Server. And I'm I'm going to walk you through some of the things that you need to excuse me. You need to learn to get started. So first off, I'm not going to show you Management Studio for now because you already know what this is. I am going to show you a couple of things. All right. A few things. First off is an SSH tool. This is the time for you to start being very comfortable working with the command line. And I mean the command line. Um, you could have a couple of different options for this. But since this is mostly getting started working with Linux, I'm not going to be using PowerShell because you could install PowerShell on Linux if you want to, or you could do uh, PowerShell remoting. If you're, you're okay and you're fine with working with PowerShell, you can do that. But let's start with this. This is a tool called Putty. And I've been using this tool since um, 2003, I think. Um, and I have been using this to connect to a remote Unix or Linux machine. Pretty simple. Uh, you provide your, let's kick off one. You provide your IP address or your host name. In my case, I use IP address because I don't have, a, I don't have a fully working DNS in my environment at the moment. And then you set off your, uh, save your settings with a meaningful name. That way, when you connect to your Linux machines, you know exactly what you're connecting to. That's one. And the other tool, let me close that for a minute. And the other tool that I want to introduce you to is WinSCP. WinSCP, it's kind of like Windows Explorer that you can use to copy files to and from Windows and Linux. Yes. Um, and of course, this guy decided to pop up and say, a new version has been released. This is a, a a tool that I have been using, same time frame, because again, um, when I was starting out, you know, I'm more familiar with with dragging, dropping, copying, and pasting all of this information from uh, Windows Explorer. So it made the transition a little bit easier working with <clears throat> with uh, with Linux in general. Now, Linux is a file-based system. By the way, uh, if you want to grab a copy of Putty, you go to putty.org. You can download and install it. In my case, I didn't install um, um, the utility. I just downloaded the .exe file and just run the .exe file. If you want to download WinSCP, go to winscp.net and you can download uh, this tool as well. These are the two most common tools that you'll be using to get started. And I'm going to show you how you can use them in this session. So I'm going to open up a... Uh, I'm going to open up my uh, my terminal, and I'm also going to show you how you could uh, leverage 
copying and pasting files because Linux is a file-based operating system, uh, unlike Windows where you have, oops, unlike Windows where you have, um, let me turn off my audio. Unlike Windows where you're dealing with, um, uh, where you're dealing with um, registry and DLLs, these guys are, or Linux is a file-based operating system. Let me just, let me make sure that I'm connecting. Give me a second. Twenty-nine. Okay. Twenty-nine. And twenty-nine and thirty. Okay. Let me log back in. Reason I'm not connecting is because my IP address has changed. Give me a quick second while I fix that. This is 29. There we are. And I also want to make sure that I can connect to the other one. Ah, good. Okay. Close that. Okay. So what you're seeing here is a blank uh, terminal command line terminal. Like I said, working with Linux requires uh, working with the command line and being very comfortable with the command line. So I'll start working, uh, I'll start showing you some of the things that you have to consider. First of all, first of all, be very, very comfortable with navigating the file system on uh, in Linux. Whether it's using WinSCP like this, so say for instance, I, I will connect to, uh, let me see. I want to connect to this machine. And just again, just to show you how this is really nothing to be afraid of because I can navigate through the file system using WinSCP, but most of your administrative tasks will be done on the command line. Okay, that's why I started off with introducing the command line. So you might have noticed I ran a command earlier, IP address show. This is a command to display the IP address of this machine because how can I connect to a remote machine if I don't know what the IP address is? So that's the starting point. Um, and everything in a Linux uh, environment is file-based. So we'll look at some of the basic commands, like for instance, ls. This is kind of like your DIR in uh, in in DOS, where you can list down uh, you can list down the contents of the current directory. Now, right now, I can use PWD PWD command or my present working directory to to see that I'm in the forward slash home forward slash and then my uh, my personal directory. This is kind of like your um, directory profile in Windows, kind of like your uh, your uh, profile account. And Windows will create a specific folder for you. So let's navigate out of that and display the contents of the root directory, kind of like the, the, the top level directory. And you can see different directories, directories in here, like bin, dev, home, and different directories. Like I said, your effectiveness to work with Linux is your comfort level in working with the file system. So let me explore some of those things with you. And um, I try not to type in demos. It's not a really good practice to do that. So first thing that I usually do is have a look at the uh, have a look at the version of the operating system I'm using. I'm using a Red Hat uh, uh, community version in CentOS. So like I said, CentOS is the community version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux because I don't want to be paying a uh, subscription for, for Red Hat just to you know see what's going on and learn Linux. Um, I've shown you the contents of, of the root directory. In fact, if I look at 
if I look at the top level directory, you can see the exact same directories in um, WinSCP, much like what you would see in here. I can use the minus L to display the list of directories in here. One distinction between uh, Linux and Windows is that in Windows, we call them folders. In Linux, we call them directories. Same concept, different implementation under the covers. I wanted to showcase, because I already have SQL Server on Linux installed here, I wanted to showcase um, the location, the default location of where the SQL Server, uh, SQL Server files are. By default, SQL Server stores the data and the log files inside the var opt ms sql directory okay well, let's have a look at that inside var opt ms sql and then data if you look at this it looks exactly like what we're familiar with with the c program files microsoft sql server or the default uh, data and log directories for your sql server databases right let's try and navigate to uh, that directory var opt ms sql ooh i get a permission denied i want to introduce you to one concept that linux has when it comes to uh, least privilege and this is one thing i really like about linux because linux is secure by design the account that i'm using to log into my linux machine is a member of a local administrators group on linux it has administrative privileges. But here's the thing. Remember, my, remember what I told you about least privilege. Unless you explicitly tell the operating system that you want to perform an administrative task or access a, uh, access a directory or a file that requires elevated privileges, it will prevent you from doing so, even if you're a member of the local administrators group. Unlike in Windows, um, if you're logging in as administrator, you can do whatever you want. You can format the drives, you can you know, reboot the machine all you want. It's not gonna stop you uh, unless you turn on user access control, which most of us actually turn off. So that's one thing I like about Linux. And so how do we, how do we proceed with performing administrative tasks? You do so by prefixing your command with sudo. Now sudo is, kind of like an impersonation command. You're telling Linux, uh, I want to do this, but can you please elevate my permissions as I do this? Sudo is short for super user do. So I want to run the exact same command, but I want to prefix it with sudo. It will ask for my password. And now I can, uh, I'm, uh, I can navigate to that directory. So I could list, I could list the folders and the contents of that directory. But in this case, instead of just using my account, I am elevating my privileges so that I can read and write um, data, uh, Files. I'm talking about files here because as far as Linux is concerned, your MDF and NDF and LDF files are still files. So I could see those. I could uh, look at the data drive as you've seen inside uh, WinSCP, where you have your master, your model, your MSDB, TempDB, and all of the SQL, uh, SQL Server system databases. And again, it's just a matter of uh, knowing how to navigate across your uh, across your uh, file systems. Now let's try to connect to that SQL Server instance using SQL Server Management Studio. And I am going to use the sysadmin login or just SA login because you know it's a brand new install and I haven't joined this machine to Active Directory so I can't use, oops, so I can't use my uh, my Active Directory account. So 
want to make sure that I'm connecting to the right one. Oh, it's 29. Okay. 29. And if you can see, I am connected to a SQL Server instance inside my Linux environment. If I run select at, at version, I'm running SQL Server 2019 with CU8. Developer edition running on Send OS Linux 7. And you know what's really interesting is you see this cute little penguin icon in SQL Server Management Studio. So as far as managing SQL Server is concerned, you know, it's basically the same look and feel, it's the same environment. The only difference, of course, is if you want to start working with the file system, then you need to be comfortable with the file system using um an SSH client and navigating your way across the file system using commands. And I've shown you a couple of them, um, you know, LS to display the files. Um, you could copy, um, instead of me using this, let's do something. Um, I want to copy a backup and I want to use WinSCP for this. I want to copy a, a backup file from my Windows machine to my Linux machine. So I want to uh, copy these two, uh, AdventureWorks and Northwind. Drag and drop. And there it is. I just copied those backups using, uh, using um, WinSAP from my Windows machine to my Linux machine. And those backups were taken from a, a Windows machine, SQL Server, uh, and I believe this one is from a SQL Server 2008 instance. Took a backup of them, and we just copied them over to our Linux machine. And why don't we try and restore those databases from backups? And if you look, it's, it's exactly the same user experience. I have that. Files, uh, I'll relocate the, the files and the folders. I'll keep them as, as they are. Again, same user experience working with SQL Server on Linux as if it was you know just like the same SQL Server that we loved and known ever since. So now I have my, uh, my Northwind database restored from backup. And um, if you look at Hopefully my compatibility level is supported. Because I believe, yeah, it was taken from a SQL Server 2008 backup. So I'm gonna uh, change my compatibility level. But like I said, it's the same look and feel as working with SQL Server on Windows because it's the same database environment. It's the same database engine. You know, and you could, you could uh, work with both Windows and Linux using the same tools that we know and love, which is SQL Server Management Studio. Or if you're using Azure Data Studio, you can do so, or even Visual Studio, okay? I've walked you through some of these things, but let's start diving deep into, uh, let's start diving deep into some of these things that we can do as SQL Server DBAs. For instance, if we look at the default uh, the default database settings. My data, my log and backup directories are by default in this specific directory, which means if I create a database, they're all gonna be here. What if I wanna change them? You know, just like best practices that we do as SQL Server DBAs, we um, store our data files in the database files rather on a separate drive, not necessarily the C drive. Um, we can do the exact same thing here, but unlike uh, on Windows where you could change these settings using either SQL Server Management Studio or SQL Server Configuration Manager, uh, unfortunately, there is no such thing. And Microsoft provided us, provided us with a tool called MS SQL Conf. So let me uh, do one thing, and that is to change the data, the log in. Well, we'll start with the data and the log directory first. First off, 
I want to create a um, I want to create a directory inside my root directory, and I want to create inside a TMP directory. Uh, CD TMP. So I'm going to create a directory named, uh, I don't know, uh, DB data. I'll create that directory, TMP data, and I'm going to use the mkdir command for this. Z. So I just created a directory named data. And if you look at this, this was created by a user named root. Now, wait a second. If we look at the permissions in SQL Server, we know for a fact that the SQL Server service accounts need to have permissions on a directory or a folder in Windows if you want SQL Server to be able to read and write from it. So if you're creating database files, the SQL Server service account needs to have permissions to read and write to that. And it's the same concept. Here, it is the user root that owns this directory, which means SQL Server will not be able to create databases in here. So what do we do? Well, we have to first change the ownership and the group ownership for that directory. Now, by default, when you install SQL Server on Linux, it will create a default user and a default group called MSSQL. And this is kind of like the SQL Server service account that, uh, that SQL Server uses to perform different tasks. So we are going to assign permissions to, uh, to that directory, both ownership and group ownership. So if we look at uh, the owner and the group, now it's owned, the directory is owned by MSQL, which is again, the default user account SQL Server uses to perform tasks within Linux. Now that we're done with that, we can now start making modifications to the, uh, the SQL Server configuration using the MS SQL conf utility. Now let's, uh, let's, let's navigate to that directory and make sure that we are, uh, we're changing the file location dot default data dir. This is the parameter that you need to pass to MS SQL conf. And then you pass the new location of the directory where you want your database uh, data and log files to get created. And of course it tells you, you need to restart SQL Server in order for the changes to take effect. So I will uh, start SQL Server using this very command. Now let's test it. I want to create a new database. Uh, sample EV. And if we have a look at, if we have a look at the files, for those databases, or for that database, the database files are now in <clears throat> the, the new default data and log directory that we created for that. Now, moving forward, every time you create a new database, every time you restore a database, unless you explicitly tell SQL Server to move the files around, creating a new database, it will uh, create those databases in that specific directory. And like I said, because there's no SQL Server Management Studio configuration changes, there's no SQL Server Configuration Manager in Linux, we are going to be using the MS SQL Conf utility, MS SQL Conf, to, uh, uh, to uh, make those changes. Like if you want to set your trace flags, if you want to enable SQL Server Agent, this is the utility that you need to use. Now let's take it a step further. Uh, let me connect to let 
Let me connect to this one. This is another C, uh, Linux inst, uh, machine, but in this case, I don't have any SQL Server installed. And if you uh, if you look at it, I don't have any SQL Server installed. Let's go through the process of installing SQL Server on Linux from scratch. And I want to explain a couple of things here. And this is the ex these are the commands that I need to run. In fact, when you look at it, it's pretty straightforward. I only have like four commands. In fact, you can script this. Four commands. The first line here is I want to download a repo file. The repo file is simply a, a definition of where to search for the installation packages. Kind of like when you're using your phones. And when you're updating your apps on your phones, you're not telling uh, Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. You're not telling it, hey, look for the uh, package from this location. The package manager knows exactly where those packages are using its own repo file. So you can install, you can update um, your apps and not even have to worry about the location. That's what the repo file is for. So the first command is simply using the curl command, downloading the repo file from here. And this is the repo file for uh, SQL Server 2019 on Linux and storing it in this directory. And then we run this command to install SQL Server on Linux. Yes, pretty straightforward, right? Next, we're going to be using the MS SQL conf utility again, but in this case, we're running setup. We want to run setup to complete the installation of SQL Server. So the, the, the first, uh, the second line here is just to install the packages. The third line here is to install SQL Server with some of these parameters. Like I want my uh, license to be using developer edition. I want to accept the EULA. I want to pass the SA password. Three things that are required when you're installing SQL Server. And at the end of it, I'm going to start or enable SQL Server. So let me run this in the background. And of course, depending on how fast it's in the running sections. But let's permit the server even with a configuration file. And I'm only referring to the database engine. I'm not referring to uh, analysis services, integration services, report. I'm not even referring to those. I'm only referring to uh, the database engine itself, the relational database engine. From my experience, you know, 20 to 25 minutes between the time that you run uh, setup.exe passing the configura configuration file, on average, depending again on how uh, how powerful your machine is, roughly 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and the fact that you have to have a local copy of the installation media so that you can run setup.exe, 20 to 25 minutes, not so much with SQL Server on Linux because now it's almost done. Yeah, it is done. And it only took, what, two to three minutes? Because I was talking as I was doing this. <clears throat> and yes, now we have SQL Server running in less than two to three minutes. I've managed to install SQL Server on Linux that fast using a few lines of code. And trust me, I've automated installations of, of SQL Server across different environments. In fact, I created my own utility to do uh, what I call the self-service SQL Server installation but it's not as fast as this. And that's one thing about running SQL Server on Linux. Now, let's uh, continue on because, you know, just like, uh, just like running SQL Server on Windows, I don't recommend that you turn off your Windows firewall. But in addition to making sure that your SQL Server is accessible, you have to enable 
uh, the ports to allow traffic to and from the uh, SQL Server instance uh, from a remote machine, or in our case, management studio, uh, you know, remote tools that connect to SQL Server. So we are going to use, um, or we are going to configure the default firewall, which is firewall D, to add port 1433 on the firewall. And then we will reload um, the firewall rules for those to take effect. And done. Let's try and connect to our SQL Server on Linux machine, brand new install using SQL Server Management Studio. And I'm going to pass my SA password. And there we are. We are now connected to a brand new SQL Server instance running on Linux. Come on. And then we could uh, explore some of the things here like, uh, you know, what are default settings? What's the host name? Because you might be wondering, wait, what's the, what's the host name for this? Again, these are two different machines. This one already had SQL Server running. This one, we installed it from scratch, pulled SQL Server binaries from um, the repo file, uh, installed it, automated, restarted. Now we have a working SQL Server instance. This one is named CentOS SQL 01, while this one is named CentOS SQL 02. Again, brand new installation of SQL Server on Linux machine, given uh, the same look and feel, but with the diff with a different uh, with a different uh, configuration settings. Like I said, these are the defaults. While the other one that we were working with we used or we changed the default data and log backup or log directory rather. Just like that. So these are just some of the things that you can start working with. And like I said, start working with the tools like PuTTY for instance and SSH sessions uh, connecting to a remote Linux machine using an SSH client like PuTTY, uh, navigating the file system using WinSCP. If you're still, you know, a little bit uncomfortable with the command line, this is a good start. If you want to make modifications to uh, configuration files inside Linux, you can do it with your favorite text editor on Windows and then just make modifications to them. So for instance, if I want to... Uh, if I want to look at MSQL conf, this is the file that SQL Server uses to take a look at some of the configuration settings. Like for instance, we changed our default data and uh, log directory. Now I can modify this using a text editor on Windows, copy back to, uh, to Linux, restart SQL Server in order for the change to take effect. Although I don't recommend doing that because sometimes we fat finger some of the uh, stuff that we type. And next thing you know, there's one extra dot or comma or stuff that we accidentally do. That's why I highly recommend using tools like uh, MSQL Conf. And you've seen how we used MSQL Conf twice, one for setting default, uh, setting configuration within SQL Server, and the other is by running MSQL Conf for installing and setting up SQL Server during the initial uh, configuration experience. This is just the beginning. Like I said, we're just touching uh, the tip of the iceberg here. It's just the beginning of what you can do. There's so many things that you can do with uh, 
uh, with running SQL Server on Linux. And here's something that could, again, be a really good opportunity for you. Your developers won't even dare log into Linux if they don't know Linux, which means you're, you're preventing people from logging in, uh, which makes your database systems highly available because, again, they're, they're, they're not touching it. There's no, uh, they're, they're not going to cause any accidents of rebooting the machine, right? Uh, I do have a couple of questions here from Christian. I would like to know the benefits from MS SQL on Linux. That's a great question. And probably the question that a lot of people ask is, so would it make sense for me to uh, work with SQL Server on Linux? For one, um, if you're a big Windows shop and all of your deployments are running on Windows, there's really no sense for you to work on SQL Server on Linux unless these are new applications that you're rolling out. The biggest, uh, uh, the biggest drive that I've seen customers do uh, ever since Microsoft launched SQL Server on Linux and SQL Server 2017 was number one, to standardize. We have clients that are, uh, you know, running Oracle and, and MySQL and, you know, other SQL Server, uh, other database platforms, and they're all running on Unix or Linux. And they want to standardize. They have, uh, you know, database platforms running on SQL Server. Why not just standardize on running C uh, SQL Server on Linux as well, so that you know they only have to worry about, you know, sysadmins dealing with Linux. That's one. Another benefit is if you uh, if you look at how easy it is to install SQL Server on Linux. You haven't seen SQL Server on Docker containers yet. It is as quick as less than a few seconds. So think about that for a second. If you need to deploy SQL Server fast, in the past, it would take you an average, again, even if you automate the installation of SQL Server on Windows, from my experience, top 15 minutes. You saw me install SQL Server on Linux from scratch in less than two minutes. Now, I could have automated the entire thing. In fact, I have a... a I have a, uh, I'm opening up the Q&A panel here. I'm, uh, I, I have a script that actually installs everything from start to finish, and all I have to do is run that script. I don't even have to touch anything. Um, one question here is, can I have multiple instances? The answer to that is no, you cannot have multiple instances of SQL Server in the same machine. And this is where running SQL Server in Docker containers come in. So you could have multiple instances, not necessarily named instances. They're all default instances. You're just redirecting them to different port numbers. Is it possible to run features like SSIS or MSRS on Linux? Reporting services, no. Uh, we're still waiting on Microsoft on how they, they could port reporting services on Linux. Um, even with SQL Server 2019, it still is part of the unsupported features Integration services, yes, it is supported. You can install integration services separately. And this is one thing I like about the installation process. You only install what you need. Another question here from Darius. Are there any limitations versus the Windows version? Yes, there are. Um, Microsoft focused their efforts in the, um, in the 2017 version with enhancements in the database engine, meaning that's all they really focused on initially. And that's why you see uh, some of the uh, uh, features that were not enabled yet. And keep in mind, as of SQL Server 2019, this is a V2 product, which means there's, there's a lot of catching up to work on when it comes to uh, bringing in the features so that they could be, you know, one-to-one, -one, uh, there could be a one-to-one -one mapping between features on Windows versus features on Linux. In fact, one of those features was excuse me, transactional replication. It was in the later part of SQL Server 2017 that Microsoft introduced support for uh, transactional, transactional replication in SQL Server on Linux. Another question here from, you know, it's interesting. It's, I get, I get the kick out of reading like anonymous attendee. I'm pretty sure your first name is not anonymous and your last name is not attendee, but I'm reading it as is. The SQL Server uh, on Linux support, SSIS, SSRS, or SSAS, uh, like I said, reporting services, 
isn't supported yet analysis services. Uh, there's a little bit of support there, uh, but integrated services, integration services is fully supported. Christian was saying, uh, I used SQL Server on Windows containers and the image is very large. I'm actually doing an entire workshop. In fact, after this, I'll be doing an entire workshop on SQL Server on containers. And I try not to talk about SQL Server on Windows containers because I like history. And when I say I like history and I mean it, um, I tell people the best predictor of someone's future is by observing what they're doing in the present. When I do my presentations, it's not just about technical, it's not just about you know technology. I try to introduce things that would make people think, and this will revolutionize your, your life. I can guarantee you that. Um, think of products like performance point services in the past. Microsoft acquired a company to, uh, that build, uh, built performance point services, incorporated it in SharePoint. Next thing you know, you don't hear anything from Microsoft on the development of performance point services. SharePoint 2016, no more performance point services. Let's use an example from the SQL Server world. Notification services. Yeah, Microsoft introduced notification services in SQL Server 2005. Didn't hear much on the development. SQL Server 2012, no more notification services. And I want to, uh, again, I want to throw this thought out there so that you can think about this. And I, like I said, it's going to revolutionize your life. The best predictor of someone's future is by observing what they're doing in the present. And this does not just apply to how Microsoft builds products. It doesn't, it doesn't just apply to how you can drive your career. Because people are asking, do I focus on Azure? Do I focus on AWS? Do I Don't ask those questions. Observe and then come up with your own predictions. So this is not just, hey, are we, are we going to be looking at SQL Server on Windows containers in the future? Uh, no. And I can confidently say that because I have been observing what Microsoft has been doing in the present, which means they're not doing anything on, uh, on the developments for SQL Server on Windows containers. All right. Uh, what else? Uh, any questions in here? Uh, so far, I've answered the questions in the Q and A. Type them. Uh, type your questions in the in the Q and A and in the chat. I'm actually reading both the Q and A and the chat windows simultaneously. Uh, so Darius, yes, uh, already emphasized that there are features from the Windows version that have not been ported over to the Linux version. But keep in mind, though, Microsoft is constantly in um, in the developments for these. Um, give me a quick second while I make sure that I answer all of the questions. All right. So this is kind of like, uh, like I said, just an introduction, just to get you started on working with SQL Server on Linux. And if you, I'll, I'll take and use the quote that I mentioned earlier, the best predictor of someone else's future is by observing what they're doing in the present. If you observe since SQL Server 2017, Microsoft has invested so much on SQL Server on Linux, be it uh, on Azure, be it on uh, Docker containers, be it in Kubernetes. You know for a fact that Microsoft is not kidding. This is not a pet project. This is a full blown business unit. And if Microsoft is investing so much on this, you can bet your career that taking a stab at SQL Server on Linux can get you, uh, can, can you know, skyrocket your career within the next five years because that is exactly what Microsoft is investing on. And uh, I wrap, I'll wrap this up with the story of the reason why I moved to SQL Server in the first place. Like I said, I used to be an Oracle DBA, but I took that quote, you know, the best predictor of someone's futures by observing what they're doing in the present. Back in the days of Oracle 7 and 8, Oracle was not doing much. They were so confident at their market share that they didn't innovate. They didn't do 
um, you know, new things. They didn't engage their customers they, and they were not doing anything. And so I saw that as writing on the wall and I said, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to move to the SQL Server because that's going to be the future. And I made the right decision and I'm still doing it today and serving what's going on in the market and looking at what companies are doing today because that will be the predictor of their future. And with that, I want to wrap this thing off. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, Christian has a follow-up question. What we have to consider when we start thinking about migration from MS SQL on Windows to MS SQL on Linux. Number one, count the cost. And when I say count the cost, I mean um, weigh the cost. Is it more expensive for you to stay on Windows or to move to Linux? I had a client and they're a big Linux shop. They're a big Linux shop and the only Windows machines that they have are their Active Directory machines and their SQL Server machines. They came up to me and said, hey, we want to deploy SQL Server on Linux and then we want to implement always on availability groups. The only question I asked that got them to reconsider was how many of your engineers know how to manage Linux pacemaker like the back of their hands? And keep in mind, this is a company that is top to bottom, all Linux people. The only Windows machines they have are their Active Directory machines and SQL Server. That was enough reason for them not to move into SQL Server on Linux. They stayed with SQL Server on Windows because again, as far as operations cost is concerned, it is going to be very, very, very expensive. So count the cost and that becomes your reason to migrate. All right, then I hope that answered your question. And again, thanks very much for joining in um, um, and thank you for having me in uh, today's session. Enjoy the rest of your day, goodbye.